So thank you very much to the Geneva Peace Week for giving us this opportunity. Today we'll be talking about humanitarian negotiations under pressure. Um, well, as probably most of you know, although IHL really guarantees uh, access for relief to civilians affected uh, by armed conflict, uh, and guarantees that parties to the armed conflict allow unimpeded passage of uh, humanitarian relief, often access to these populations really depend on the competence of humanitarian staff in negotiating access. Yeah? It depends on their ability to negotiate and engage with parties to armed conflict and convince them of the humanitarian character of their operations. And as you also know, <coughs> Humanitarian work is mostly in armed conflict uh, during active hostilities, which means that frontline humanitarian negotiators often work in complex environments in uh, where, where there is a lot of pressure and a lot of stress from the ongoing violence. And, uh, and not just that, what adds a layer of, even a layer of complexity is the humanitarian imperative, the urgency of needs which means that negotiators, humanitarian negotiators, often negotiate under tremendous pressure. And, uh, and I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today. We are very lucky to have them. They are three senior humanitarian negotiators. Pascal Hunt from ICRC, uh, Julie Daphne from UNHCR, and Mehmed Balchi from Fight for Humanity. They all have tremendous long-term experience in frontline humanitarian negotiators, and they have been too kind to give us this opportunity today and share some of their experience with us. So, um, first of all, I'd like to say a few words about the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiation. It's been created in 2016 as a strategic partnership between the ICRC, UNHCR, Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans Frontières, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, and the World Food Programme to promote a methodological approach to humanitarian negotiations. Negotiations as a soft skill for humanitarian staff has often been overlooked, although it has been, as we discussed, essential for the ability of humanitarian organizations to access populations affected by armed conflict. And the fact that the CCHN has been created by these five agencies is a recognition of this important skill. And CCHN has been mandated to do four things. First of all, capture and analyze frontline negotiation experiences. Second, develop negotiation tools and methods. And you can find some of those on our website. Third thing is to mobilize the community of practice around issues of common interest. And when I talk about community of practice, I mean the community of practice of frontline humanitarian negotiators. And fourth, uh, provide peer-to-peer -peer advisory services on live negotiations. And uh, recently, we, the CCHN contributed to a mobilization effort on this specific to topic, negotiating under pressure, where we organized a retreat nearby in Co, above Montreux, uh, with uh, more than 25 negotiators, experienced negotiators, on dealing and, cope and coping mechanisms related to negotiating under pressure, and looking at specific methodologies on negotiating under pressure. And, uh, and today is an opportunity to look at that from a frontline perspective. So, um, Pascal Hund, thank you for being here with us. Pascal Hund, you joined the ICRC in 1995, and you've held several positions in Rwanda, DRC, Congo Brazzaville, Afghanistan, and Central Asia. You were head of delegation a couple of times, yeah, in Somalia, Jordan, Sudan, and Afghanistan. And from 2012 to 2018, you were the head of the assistance division in Geneva, overseeing teams of experts, ICRC programs in the domain of health, economic security, water and habitat, and weapon contamination. And currently, you are a crisis manager at the ICRC director of operations. So uh, my guess is that you are quite familiar with that topic. Uh, Let's see. <laughs> all right. So you will be sharing with us a story about a negotiation you've been involved in while you were with the ICRC, uh, with a range of parties to armed conflict, correct? Yes, correct. Good afternoon. 
Uh, and first, as you said, uh, I think negotiation is really at the art of humanitarian action, you know, because here in Geneva, we believe that as soon as you speak about IHL neutrality and impartiality, everyone will agree on that. But the reality in the field is slightly different, and we really have to engage and discuss with the vast range of interlocutors just to ensure and get our license to operate on a daily basis, not only about our security, but really uh, about the conduct of our operation and ma making sure that really uh, the principled humanitarian action uh, is being respected. And as you can imagine, this is not an easy task uh, for our teams in the field. But with this type of history, the RCRC uh, has track record in discussing and engaging with a vast range of interlocutors from government to non-state armed groups. And as I speak, uh, we roughly engage uh, on a yearly basis with you know, 400 uh, non-state armed groups around the globe. Huh? So the, the, the small anecdote uh, I will give you happened uh, once upon a time in, in a country affected by many uh, non-international armed conflict or internal conflict with uh, front lines, a very fluid situation, front lines moving uh, quite rapidly. And one day there were foreign workers working for the government and during the night the front line moved and they ended up on the other side. Which of course created a huge embarrassment for the host government for the non-state armed group and for many countries. And this negotiation or roughly this intermediation was about to take these foreign workers back home or transfer them to a third country. Um, the process lasted uh, quite a while, more than three weeks, with many stakeholders having uh, quite a significant amount of distrust among themselves, to say the least. Uh, they did not agree on anything at the beginning, although it seems to be quite simple. And those people were uh, staying in a besieged area where you had massive humanitarian problems. So the role of the RCRC was to approach all the parties and to ensure that we would be able to uh, play the role of neutral intermediary between all of them and bring uh, them safe back to, to a third country uh, outside them. Uh, the pressure was quite intense on the diplomatic front, as you can imagine. Uh, on the humanitarian front as well, because the health condition of these people was deteriorating on a daily basis. And we had to negotiate a vast range of issues from temporary ceasefire to uh, overflight clearances, uh, security guarantees, uh, and so on. So it lasted for, 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 for three weeks. The outcome was quite positive. So we managed to bring them outside safely, all of them. Um, but at the same time, we also wanted to, you know, play our role and provide some humanitarian aid to that besieged area. And we were confronted with a, a bit of an ethical dilemma uh, when we were, at one stage, forced to choose between the foreign workers and the victims of the conflict on the ground. And we had to make a really tough decision, uh, either to lose everything or at least to free, uh, or to help these people to go back to their country. And we have decided at that time that you know it was better maybe at least to get these 30 people out and try the days after to again gain access to this to this area and then bring humanitarian assistance. So this was a bit the, the story in short. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Of course, it represents um, the type of choices that frontline negotiators do have to make on a daily basis. This. Uh, balance that they have to strike between pragmatism and principles. And my question to you, Pascal, is the following. Um, how were you able to make that decision? How, what was really at stake for you and how did you see your impact on the lives of the people uh, affected by armed conflict? When you enter in, 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 in such a negotiation, you have to be ready from the beginning for long negotiation. It's always better to be ready for long processes than for short one, 
mentally you prepare yourself differently, you organize yourself differently, you organize your teams differently because I had people going and negotiating on our behalf in many countries, as you can imagine. Um, you have to be ready to be confronted with extremely difficult choices, to be confronted with ethical dilemma when you know that the solution that you will bring will always be the best of the worst one. Um, you have to know your interlocutors, your stakeholders, you have to understand their interests. So that's why it is so important to engage with parties to a given conflict, even if there is no such type of negotiation beforehand. You have to understand their interests, you have to understand whether there is be maybe a common interest among all of them. So this is a long process and it's better to be prepared in advance than to be confronted uh, to type choices uh, at the last minute. Um, it's always better to know or make sure about what are the terms of the negotiation. Im improvisation sometimes is good but sometimes is a bit risky as well. Um, and you have to, uh, they are choices that you just can't make a loan, you know, so you, you have a team with you, you have a headquarter with you, and, you know, this type of ethical dilemma, if you share that with colleagues, uh, saying, okay, this, I have basically the choice between, you know, 30 people that are about to die, and I have a few dozens of thousands that are also about to die, but, you know, I have limited option for the time being, so I have to make a choice. Uh, these are the type of, the more open you are, with the team and within the organization about the ethical nature of the dilemma, the, the easiest it, it will be to, to, to deal with them. That's not a, a recipe per se, but a small trick maybe. Yeah. And uh, you were in a leadership position during that negotiation. How did you cope with the level of stress you were subjected to? When, when you are prepared for, for a long negotiation, you know that it will not last you know, on a 24-hour basis. You know, and you know that you will have extremely precious time before peaks of tension. And you have to, just to be ready to, just to enjoy that, to take care about yourself, about your team, to think about something else. Just that you, 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 you keep some you know, gas and energy for yourself because when really the intense phase is coming, you know that you just have to de dedicate your energy just for that and this can last one, two, three hours. And then after, it's even good that you, f you force yourself to you just clean your brain, get outside, think about something else and get ready for the next phase. Thank you. So if you could give us a few lessons learned from that experience, what would they be? The importance of training, you know, get, get prepared before the negotiation, extremely dangerous to when this type of, when life is at stake there, I mean, better not to improvise. Uh, it's good to have a good team with you, well organized, roles and responsibilities well defined uh, before. Uh, if you have the luxury of sharing your experience with other organizations, with other negotiators, uh, this would be extremely useful because, you know, we have certain ways of negotiating within the RCRC, but I'm sure we can learn from WFP, uh, MSF and others. And I, 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 This is extremely useful. And uh, as we had recently a retreat in Co, where we have professional negotiator coming uh, to us, you know, the, the guy that are uh, involved in um, hostage, uh, in kidnapping, in extortion, this type of professional negotiator, I mean, they, they can also uh, bring some yeah, good lessons for us as well. Thank you very much, Pascal. Fascinating. Um, I'd like now to move to Julie Dunphy. Julie Dunphy is also a member of CCHN's community of practice. Um, she has over 30 years of security experience with almost 20 years in international humanitarian security ranging from field postings in emergency and high-risk environments which include Bosnia, East Timor, Afghanistan, Nepal, Liberia and Sri Lanka. And during the last decade, she has held security management positions based at the UNHCR headquarters in Geneva, involved in the strengthening and professionalization of security management for her organization and the UN security management system as a whole, in addition to managing and responding to critical security incidents. Thank you for being here, Julie. 
Um, Julie, you're going to be sharing with us a story from your experience about negotiating a returns case, a refugee returns case, with a military actor. That's correct. Mm. Uh, thanks, Karim, and thanks to everyone uh, for having me here today. Um, I've been negotiating actually much longer. I've been negotiating since a child. My mother tells stories about how instead of throwing a tantrum when I wanted something, um, I would actually be nice. I would come and give her a, a drawing or I would propose in the supermarket that we should buy something for daddy. Daddy it was, would be tired. And, and likewise, I would use the same uh, strategy on my father to, gain that, to, to promote my mother so that we would look nice after being out for a day. Uh, I developed a different strategy when I was a teenager. If I wanted to go out with friends on a weekend night, I would have my friends call up and ask my parents uh, whether I could go out, that you know they were going out, they had organized lifts and the, so on and so forth. So that was the way I would, would strategize. So I've had to do it in different ways over, over the many years. In my professional career, it's changed. Um, you know, I've had situations where initially I felt perhaps I wasn't prepared, um, but time pressure was on. I've had cases where I've had to deal with people who were trying to self-harm. I have had situations whereby I have tried to persuade people to uh, make a complaint, to make a report, to um, help others, that they would not be alone. And I had to use a lot of persuading mechanisms because time was of the essence if we didn't um, obtain uh, their statements and forensic evidence. So I've had to do a lot in terms of negotiating, um, persuading people, making sure that it is in their interests. So I, I developed it not just for my interests over the years, but for other people's interests. Um, as Karim mentioned, I work for UNHCR, uh, the UN Refugee Agency. Um, we currently, for those of you who may not be that familiar with UNHCR, we provide support to over 70 million uh, people who are forced to flee and who are displaced globally. So, as you can imagine, um, our mandate is to protect these people. And what that means is, again, making sure that they have the uh, respect for the rights of the individual in accordance with the letter and spirit of relevant bodies of law. That's um, human rights law, international humanitarian law, which Kareem spoke about earlier on, and refugee law. So, of course, what we, when we put that down into practical terms, what we're really talking about is ensuring the physical safety, the freedom of movement for people, um, that they have access to the basic things that we all take for granted, to shelter, water, food. Um, you know, we want to make sure that they have rights to education, to health. So this is, in a nutshell, what the organization does. But um, I think what is important is that we try to seek um, solutions for these people. Now, ultimately, um, the ideal solution for everyone, of course, is to return home, to return back to their village, to their place of origin, to their town, to their community, where their connection is. That's what they want to do. Sometimes people assume that refugees all want to be resettled, but in fact, less than 1% of people are actually resettled. So the numbers are very low. People really do want to return home and that is the ideal solution. We also, however, look at local integration for many um, refugees. They may not actually be able to return home. It's that we have many situations that are long time protracted refugee situations. And in these instances, um, people may want to stay in that area. So there are a few dilemmas uh, with all this. Um, we do have to try and make sure that people return in safety and dignity. And sometimes different governments will have strategies to say, ah, the conflict is finished, we now need to provide support, and we need to, to look at this, whether it is um, a plan that is developed um, that will give the people who are going to return this safe and dignified return, that they will have access to be able to restart their lives, that they will have access to their, to their homes, that they will have access um, to schools, that uh, these facilities uh, will be built and will be there for the long term. So we want to make sure it's a sustainable return. And that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today. 
My, as Kareem has mentioned, my role is primarily in security, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my role as a security advisor when I was in the field. And my role was really to make sure that we went through a security risk management process to make sure that um, the areas uh, and the situations that we are operating within, and as has already been mentioned, we operate in many areas where there is conflict, in many areas where there are security challenges. So my role is really to do a risk management of the security environment to assess whether it is safe for both for UNHCR workforce, for partner work, workforce, so the operating partners that UNHCR has out there, and also for the returns themselves. Um, you know, is there going to be any security challenges? Are they going to be faced and have infiltration from combatants in an area? Are they going to be, uh, is there going to be extortion rackets if, if they're living in a camp situation? You know, what are the challenges, um, you know, generally in a security environment? So this is, in a nutshell, what I have been doing. So the situation that, that I want to talk about is, is a return situation whereby the government announced a plan for 100,000 people who are going to be returned within a two-week period. Now that's a considerable amount of people. That's a large town for many of us. So you can imagine it's an area uh, where there had been heavy fighting, where there had been conflict ongoing for several years. So nobody had been to this part of the country in several years, and yet now it was going to be uh, a return operation where all these people were going to be put on buses, uh, you know, and and transported to the area, and we were then, as the humanitarian community, supposed to go in and help them re-establish their lives. So I was asked to go in and conduct an assessment of the area, and one of my first ports of call when I'm doing this is, of course, to meet uh, the law enforcement agencies and the security forces. And there was a heavy military presence in the area because it was not that long ago since uh, the non-state armed groups that the combatants had apparently been moved from this area. Uh, so. Again, you know, the government had, had claimed that they were all gone, that the area was safe, but was this really the case? So I go and I meet the military commander, which is a challenge for me in some locations where they're not used to having women as security officers, but, you know, we, we work through that. Um, but what I found out in my first meeting was that the security forces were actually the ones who were going to implement the plan. Now. When, for those of you who are not overly familiar with military hierarchical structures, when the military are given a task, particularly by a, a ministry, they will carry out that to the letter of the law and the letter of the government, and it will be an absolutely brilliant plan because they're very good at planning. It's what the military do. Um, however, does it actually meet all the requirements? Um, were they thinking through some of the challenges that we as humanitarian community would see? And this was what I had to try and talk through with them. Now, what I knew, of course, about the area was that there had been heavy fighting, there had been artillery fire, there had been landmines, there was reports of housing that had been booby-trapped. And the first question then related to that that I asked was, well, has this area actually gone through a demining process how have you managed that? Is there explosive remnants of war lying around in the area? And they looked at me and said, well, we haven't had time to do that. We don't have the capacity to do that. You know, understandably so. They were still uh, in a conflict zone in other parts of the country. So how were we going to now address this? Um, they said they didn't have time for clearance, that they would try and clear the area, that they would talk to some of their commanders and they would try to clear the area after the people had returned. Well, this was not going to be a very good idea if people were going to go back to their homes and then find a, um, some type of an artillery strapped to a door or they were going to uh, find, uh, you know, um, a shell in the garden that hadn't detonated or somebody was going to walk on a personnel mine. They weren't going to be able to start harvesting their lands, planting crops um, if the area was mined. They couldn't even have cattle, uh, you know, if, so their livelihood was going to be impacted. Everything about them was going to be impacted if this area was not properly cleared. 
what did I have to do in that? Well, again, it's an additional dilemma. I could have gone back and written a report and said, hey, this is not safe for us to return. We shouldn't go in. We as the humanitarian community can, cannot support this. But how would that impact our relationship with the government? We had to think of that. Now, we don't think, just think of it in terms of relationship with the government, but we, also, we were very much thinking of it from the perspective of, you know, we can't support this return operation. The challenge, however, with that was, we also had to try and help the people, because again, I couldn't go back to that um, battalion commander and say, you need to go and tell your bosses that this isn't going to work. So I spent the next couple of weeks uh, talking to, and the next few days actually, going to talk to battalion commanders, lieutenant colonels, brigade commanders, colonels, uh, divisional commanders, generals, and so on and so forth. And in the meantime, we were trying to negotiate and uh, other people within the office were talking to district authorities, uh, to line ministries, as well as, of course, that at the capital level, um, our representative was engaged with talking with the respective ministries um, and so on and so forth. So it was a joint approach. Uh, we had to have a strategic plan in place to try and make sure within the short time frame, how were we going to, to move this forward? Now, what we did was, of course, they gave us some leverage and they did agree that, okay, well, we'll slow down, we'll phase the return. We will go in, we will clear part of the area so that one village can return, and then we will continue it in, in that phase. For anybody who's familiar with demining operations, this can take some considerable time, and time was of pressure, so we had to call in the experts, demining organizations, uh, to try and help and assist and use their technical expertise to talk about this. We did manage, we managed to get some areas cleared. We managed to get in demining, humanitarian demining teams. Uh, some of them were moved from other parts of the country. Additional ones were brought in from in outside the country. And we managed to get the technical capability required to start it. Um, and that was how we had to ap approach it. Uh, it was difficult, it's not easy to do, particularly, you know, the government didn't want to lose face. Um, but we had to make sure that this was going to be a sustainable return for, for people. Um, if I'm thinking of it in terms of, you know, the challenges um, where, we, where we went out and how I personally, you know, move some of that forward, and particularly within the time frames. Um, part of it was to adopt a strategy whereby I was actually saying to the different commanders, please come out with me, to the local authorities, please come out with me, let's go to these villages, let's find, let's see if these are safe for return ourselves. So again, my second week of the negotiation was spent on the road, and for the weeks after, where I was trying to bring um, officials who would not normally go to these areas, um, I had to put painstaking efforts in going out. Uh, sometimes I think that week I certainly tested some of my nine lives. I think I was probably already down to six or seven at that stage. I probably lost another two or three because I certainly went into, into fields, I went into houses, um, and I was finding devices. I have had a lot of mine awareness training, so <laughs> before you think that I was not practicing, um, I've, done an, I've done a couple of weeks courses on mine awareness training before. So I certainly would not let any of the other colleagues uh, go down that road. So let me stress that. Um, but I also, it was, it was just a way of me trying to demonstrate that the area wasn't safe. So again, you know, there was a lot of effort into it to engage with all the different stakeholders and keep the dialogue going at all different levels so that we could um, ensure that, that the return happened. It did, we managed, we certainly had a very much a phased approach, it was slowed down, so the government uh, was able to say, you know, a uh, hundred people returned to the village, they had that fanfare for the, the first part, um, but after that then, there was very much a slowed down, and, and it actually took uh, probably over a year to a year and a half after that. I'd actually left the operation before the the entire area was returned. So uh, it was a successful um, negotiation. Um, yeah, I think I'll I'll stop there. I'm sure these are the opportunities. Thank you very much, Julie. Fascinating. Um, my question is to you. So this is a really stark reminder of the types of challenges and dilemmas that 
we witness or that refugee populations, returning refugee populations witness. And it's also very relevant to the current humanitarian challenges we are facing as a result of armed conflict in the Middle East and Asia that is causing major displacements of populations and, uh, and movement of populations in general. So how do you see the role of CCHN's community of practice in terms of transferring this knowledge, these lessons learned to the wider community? Uh, so I think the good thing, and I've recently had the opportunity to participate in two of the CCHN events, um, I think for me um, the relevance of it is really that you are thinking about it collectively from the outset. Um, as I say, you know, I initially when I've gone into these situations you think you're alone, you think uh, you have to go in and negotiate, but I think the, the beauty of the model and the tools developed by CCHN allows the, the operation um, and not just just your own uh, organization to, to look at it and develop a plan based on the tools, but it also um, you know, enables you to have effective engagement with other people. Because as I outlined in my example, it wasn't just me doing this alone, it wasn't just uh, the office doing it alone, it was, you know, we were going beyond, we were using other expertise, we were using uh, other people within UN entities um, and other people within uh, partner organizations who would have a contact. So I think uh, for me, you know, if, if I go through the CCHN uh, tools and the, the dialogue, um, you know, that, that um, I would see, you know, I think, you know, the tools for me is really looking at the context, examining that thoroughly and making sure that if you are going in to negotiate, you really understand the context and you understand, you know, the stakeholders. I think we always talk about stakeholder map mapping and knowing who our partner is, but we need to know how they can, how we can leverage and how we can support them as well to leverage with others, because sometimes I think we forget that. Um, I think, you know, for me, the typology, um, as, as I you know, was preparing for this, I thought, did I use this? Were we actually using the typologies? Were we using the technical uh, level, the professional level, and looking at it from a political level? Because that's what we have to do in any negotiation strategy. And so I think very much then understanding, knowing your counterparts, knowing their position, um, as well as you having a clear position for negotiation, I think uh, really will help you. And I think working through these tools and the strategies that uh, CCHN has had um, and in more detail, I think is really effective because often we don't take the time out. The other thing for me that uh, the CCHN uh, courses offers is the fact that we actually do a lessons learned. We often, as humanitarians, uh, we go from one uh, crisis, so to speak, to another. We always seem to be dealing with one emergency after another. We never have time to stop and think. And I think uh, the CCHN and the uh, courses and the community of practice uh, gives you that time to actually think, reflect um, on how you have actually managed to do negotiations and to share best practices and lessons learned. Um, and I think it's only through that that we all can, can uh, work better um, and be better at our, at our roles and our jobs. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, Karim. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, I'd like to move on to Mr. Mehmet Balchi. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Geneva Peace Week Committee for giving us the opportunity to, like to collaborate with Mohammed and his colleagues from Fight for Humanity. It's the first time that CCHN collaborates with your organization, and we hope there will be other opportunities in the future to work together as well. So, Mehmet, you have worked on humanitarian negotiations with non-state armed groups in the Middle East and Latin America with the NGO Geneva Call yes. between 2000 and 2019. You have managed to obtain dozens of humanitarian commitments from armed non-state actors on the protection of children, banning sexual violence and anti-personnel landmines. You've also worked on the inclusion of humanitarian issues in the peace negotiation agendas in Colombia. And you've also developed and led programs promoting IHL norms to protect civilians' rights. And today you'll be sharing with us a story from your work on a negotiation with a non-state armed group that has been quite prominent in the media recently. Correct? All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you for your att uh, attendance. Uh, indeed, while my colleagues were speaking, I was thinking to reshape my <laughs> uh, intervention as an advantage. Uh, I was 
try to understand to be a very big organization like ICRC or part of INSR, I be part of a small NGO. What is the comparative advantage? Because uh, 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 often uh, when you are part of a small organization, you have to do everything. You have to buy your ticket, you have to contact the people, you have to do analysis, you have to rent a car. So you have to do everything. You have to be aware of everything. This is an advantage. But at the same time, this is a lot of stress. It's a lot of time consuming, a lot of it's taking your energy, so you are not concentrating sometimes on the real issue. So this is, uh, but at the same time, uh, you are not very visible, you are not known, you are uh, taking less risk. If you are part of the UN, if you are part of the uh, ICRC, maybe ICRC, so, but you can be more uh, easy target for uh, armed state actors or for other actors who are uh, different plans. In my case, uh, I worked for, uh, for many years, as Karim said, um, for uh, a small NGO, the Geneva Call, a small medium NGO, let's say, but very mobile. Uh, so we could take really easy decisions and then uh, sometimes, for years, we had really no security plans. So we were moving around without security plans. <laughs> we are using our instinct. We are relying on the uh, <laughs> uh, relying on the people's uh, uh, information. So if, uh, I can say, we, with the year, we have learned that we need security plans. We need to be more. Uh, so yes, we, and then we become more complicated. And then I have to call a UN DSS to say how is the situation, the last situation. Then I go to go ICRC office to ask them what. So it become more and more uh, uh, <laughs> to rely on the security plan of other. Uh, Leaks, which was good. I, I'm not blaming anybody. I think we have learned during the time how you can. Uh, we, well, we were working without a lot of uh, without knowledge. It was less stressful. But when you are aware about the risk, you are also stressful. But sometimes you can mitigate the risk. So my plan is really is important to analyze the risk and mitigate them. This is uh, the, I think uh, is uh, very important. You are in the field. You are humanitarian. You take the risk. There are many risks, not only risk coming from the armed groups, it's a risk in the road, risk uh, to be in the, uh, yeah, you go to Bogota, in Bogota, uh, the risk is not really ALN, FARC, or paramilitaries, it's a criminal, criminality. How do you really move around in, Bo in Bogota? Where do you go? What are you, the uh, no-go areas uh, in Bogota, for example? So this I have to, uh, then, uh, of course, this are, uh, in the retro perspective, you analyze it, or there was a lot of maybe um, in, during the action, you less you feel less stress. You say you feel really, but you in the retro perspective, you say, oh, what I did is really wrong. I could have have problems. So you try to analyze in order not to repeat them. Uh, while um, coming to the really the negotiation with the armed groups, I don't call it really negotiation. I don't think I was a negotiator. Uh, so this is more, uh, we were uh, can advocacy. We were doing more uh, raising awareness to make them aware, or uh, try to give these incentives or to the armed groups why they should respect. What are the uh, long-term impact of their behavior, on their uh, for their community or for their uh, for their future in the uh, for the in, uh, after the conflict? But uh, so we were in general we are doing this work. Of course, it's humanitarian. We want to, them to not to use landmines, not to children, to pr prohibit sexual violence. Of course, this is a, a, has no political agenda. It's a humanitarian work, but we are not giving something in, uh, in exchange. We are not going, okay, you release, I give you 50,000 or no, 100,000 dollars, or you, uh, so we were just trying to okay, make them aware of uh, the consequences of their behavior. So ideas to, they change their behavior. So they uh, respect, uh, they understand their norms and they respect them, or they respect uh, civilians, basically. So uh, this is, I, therefore, I don't really call myself a humanitarian negotiator, but a humanitarian advocacy uh, officer. <laughs> you know that because <laughs> they say in, in this, uh, I can qualify myself in, in the, Regarding the concrete case of uh, maybe that issue, the story I wanted to share with you is related to, I won't be too much, uh, I will contextualize 
maybe it's better to understand what I'm trying to say, is about Syria. Is related to Syria, is our work with the Syrian armed groups. In one hand, we are dealing with the Syrian, um, the Free Syrian Army uh, or Islamic functions, and on the other hand, dealing with the Kurdish uh, factions. So um, we were working with everybody. There was no uh, wherever we could go. Uh, I want to add something here in bracket. Uh, when we say, "Oh, we are negotiating with armed groups," I have worked for 20 years with the uh, armed groups. Believe me, I spent 10% of my time with armed groups. The rest of the time I spent with the governments, with the other stakeholders, to explain my work, to get access, to, 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 to say, okay, and because when you say, oh, I'm going to work with armed groups, or I, we would like to conduct training. No, no, what training? Why, what are you going to do? What kind of training? You are, uh, they, they will never listen to you. You will give them political legitimacy. No, they, uh, so you are uh, considered a political actor that you are uh, supporting them. So you have to explain this again and again and again. Uh, your interlocutors, you have to explain to the, your donors, you have to explain to, your, to the media, you have to explain to everybody that you are not doing a political work. You are doing, in, this is your way to influence the armed groups. So the often armed groups are more often than uh, the people are, who are surrounding uh, the, the armed groups. So you really you have to negotiate more with other actors than the armed groups itself. Uh, and that I can say uh, clearly because armed groups, okay, you go uh, and they, uh, you negotiate. They, they they listen to you or do you explain to them. They they like or they don't like. But they is, uh, so. But now if I go to Yemen to discuss with the Houthis. Believe me, I have to spend hours and months to get access to the Houthis. Uh, or, so this is, uh, in, in this case, um, we, when we uh, start working with the Kurdish groups in Northeast Syria, the YPG, uh, the first time we had to negotiate for one year really to get access to the Northeast Syria. Because uh, the, the, there were problems between the Kurds of Iraq and the Kurds of Syria, and uh, especially to, for our work, we were considered as political work, we were not allowed to, to cross. Because if you are humanitarian, well, I will bring water, I will bring the shelter, I will bring, okay, this is more concrete, they know where they, they go. But when you say I'm going to train to raise awareness, this is not, uh, wait, this is not urgent. So you have to really negotiate, we have to negotiate this access for our months to get there. So when you go there, you don't know if next, when will be the next next time because we are not in the field. We do in and we work in and out, and then you you, ha, you try to reach the maximum uh, objective you can with the armed groups. So this is also another pressure indeed on you because you are there after uh, several months, and then you try to in a half day or one day to negotiate all issues and try to. Uh, this is uh, always not good. I mean, this is really not, uh, is not uh, fructful. Then, you, you, of course, you have to come back, or if you are not in, uh, for, in our case. Anyhow, and then you, uh, again, other, uh, in, in between, the, the situation changed, access is difficult. Then, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, second time happened after eight months. You know, we were there in October, my colleague Anki is here. We were together in, uh, in October, the second time we went there in June. So, um, and then, of course, the, uh, after our talk with the groups, the group has discussed internally what we are lo looking for. So they were ready to continue the dialogue. Okay, we ha now we, we had the, the second meeting. So uh, at the time, uh, uh, they were ready to even make uh, commitments. They say we are ready to make a commitment on the landmines, not to use any more anti-personal landmines, or we are ready to commit to ban sexual violence. We are also ready to sign a commitment to ban uh, use of uh, children uh, below 18. So uh, again, it's very, very stressful. Uh, shall we accept this commitment or not? Shall they sign or not? Because uh, we are not sure if they are ready to commit, really, to respect their commitment. Because otherwise, we, we could have been used by the group that say, okay, they sign, but they, then they don't respect them. Because there were a lot of media intentions, uh, hundreds of the correspondents that, that this group is going to sign uh, commitments. So it's good for us, visibility, of course, it's good for us, uh, this engagement, they are uh, signing this commitment. Uh, but we were very, very uh, stressful for us to accept the one on the children. Uh, the, the children one because we will know because we know to whom we are talking we know their practice we know their past we know there will be difficulties to not respect this commitment straight uh, 18 years old so therefore we accepted uh, the two commitments and not accepted the, uh, the third one we say okay we come back 
to discuss again. You, you discuss well internally, we will discuss internally. Uh, so they were ready to sign a uh, commitment to, for straight 18 years old, uh, but we didn't accept. Second time when we went there, we said they signed with a reservation. 16 and 17 years old can be members, not combatants. But uh, we accepted but at the same time, it's very stressful for us because in one hand we wanted to get this signed because we know there are a lot of children uh, below 18 are used, they can benefit from the commitment. But at the same time, if you had not accepted, so uh, somehow we were given the um, let's say, um, green light for to them to continue to use the children. In this case, we accepted really deliberately uh, these reservations with, uh, that the children uh, cannot be members, uh, cannot be combatants, but can be members. And the day after, they show up with 100 kids released. So, okay, these are the kids we just separated, we hand it over to you. Take care of them. Okay, this is, uh, what do you do now? So uh, we work with them, they uh, separate the kids, and you are there, you are not prepared to receive these kids. They are not international organizations. They're interested, they're, they're interested. They're interested, but they're to, to, to deal with 100 kids and to reintegrate them in their families or case management, nothing was ready. Nothing was ready. But still, at that time, still in the ongoing discussion, I think it was a good decision that we have signed, they released these children. What happened to the children and all the story is a long story, but we had accepted this uh, commitment and the release of the children. And then we, uh, uh, I was not a child specialist, no child protection, no child reintegration. Okay, okay. Let's, uh, there, we, we haven't even know about the standards of the reintegration. But the fact that children are separated, not in the front line, they are in the some houses waiting to be reintegrated. So we were run after the organizations. Save the children, ICRC, uh, not ICRC, I don't to be honest, uh, IRC, uh, UNICEF. Uh, but, it was, but nobody was ready because no, it's not in their strategy. They didn't know about it, why they should come, uh, uh, jump in like this. I just finished. So, but still, we, I will finish, I can accept questions. We stopped, uh, let's say, we accept the children. Children stay in the houses. Uh, thanks to the Swiss government, we had some funding to give some food, uh, the higher teachers, the uh, general education. To, uh, for two years, we have dealt with these uh, uh, children in these houses. Most of them went home. Uh, some of them, uh, they were there, they didn't know where to go. They were coming in the waiting, re uh, waiting room. Some of them rejoined uh, the group. But uh, during this, they, they mobilized, uh, thanks to the commitment, to about 200 children. But without really any standards uh, of reintegration. The children just went uh, home and they were, uh, so I, I can't be accused or not blamed or that we not having worked with the standards. It's true, we haven't really, there was no organization, we were not ready, but still we saved, I think, hundreds of, uh, more than hundreds of the life of these uh, children integrated in their families. It was all stressful. Are we are respect the standards? Are we are really uh, manipulated? Are the children are really uh, used in the, these houses to be reintegrated? At the end, I can, with my conscience, I say it was good work, good job, uh, stressful, but we saved the lives. So I think this is uh, my story, but uh, is another aspect of these stories, of course, is still ongoing. Then I uh, worked, uh, then the second phase, just to finish, then uh, UNIS, uh, United Nations came in, in uh, two years ago, said, okay, we want to engage SDF. Uh, to uh, cause, uh, to uh, cancel the reservation, and they will sign the, the, the uh, an action plan straight 18. Fine, we had prepared the ground. Now they can engage in the, the group and for uh, uh, and commitment straight 18. So I, as, I was also involved in this process until I, right now I am involved in this process. Then. I will not talk about this process, but it's the contrary this time. With, with a lot of standards, a lot of uh, preparations, uh, the group is ready to release the children, but uh, the, the partners are not ready to receive these children. Which one was the best story? I don't know. Mehmet Belchi, thank you very much for this uh, candid testimony on some of your experience in negotiating respect for the protection of children and children's rights with non-state armed groups. Um, you said that you relied on instinct yeah, heavily in your work when negotiating with non-state armed groups. Uh, did you, although obviously your instinct proved to be quite a, a resource, important resource for you, 
did you at times feel ill-equipped uh, and not having the right tools and methods in terms of analysis, planning, and implementing your negotiation process? Yeah, of course. When I, in retro perspective, I, when I look, when I started in, in 2000 and then today after 20 years, of course, I think that you are not very professional. You can't be more if, uh, efficient if you had all these tools. So we were, we, then with the time, we were equipped with the tools, with the experience, we learned from other actors, so we had also analyzed our own, own experiences. So, of course, then uh, uh, the, our instinct is not enough. Of course, instinct is good. Instinct, but instinct is not enough. You have, I mean, uh, I personally, I, since I'm talking about the story, because uh, I, I worked in a country where I, I, I was aware of the situation even before joining Geneva Call. I know about uh, ALN, I know about the FARC, I know I was very much interested in the Colombian peace process in the past. So, uh, for example, oh, in, uh, in, I am Kurdish origin, I, I come from the, the Kurdish. Uh, this, uh, with the, with the, from this area, I know who is more or less uh, who is who. This helped me a lot to move around this in, in this context. I didn't really need to be trained by the others or to. So I know uh, who is in the PKK, who is who in the YPG, who is who in the Kurdish. Uh, so I know how to, who is the right person uh, to to, uh, to talk to, and then we were not really. Uh, so this helped a lot. But at the same time, uh, from the, uh, there were a lot of uh, aspects that were not prepared, but we are using our instinct, common sense, that we, uh, that we should go ahead. So sometimes you need, really, you go to Colombia, you go to Nariño or Pasto in the Ecuador border, but the, 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 you have planned your activities, you want to uh, go, and the last night something had happened, you have to understand what you do. Uh, what are going, who is really there? Who, uh, you need uh, your, uh, you need uh, yeah to know the, the situation, what happened. But then I, I will not call the UN and they says, oh, what do you think? They are not ready. They haven't analyzed. But I have to take a decision in, in, in two hours. I'm not going to. So the, the, therefore, you have to take decision, uh, and then you have to use your uh, instinct as well. So I, I hadn't really had pro problems, big problems. We had some problems, but not really. Uh, big, uh, but we, we took some risk. But uh, so far, it went well. In, in my case, at least, I don't suggest to do everybody like this. But I, I did. But uh, it, it worked. But it's not always the best way. <laughs> so we we invite you to to have a look at some of the tools and methods that we've developed at CCHN. Definitely. They um, they cover they cover um, analysis, planning, and implementation of. Uh, of humanitarian negotiation processes, and they are based on experiences such as yours that were successful. Although you didn't have the necessary tools or methods to work with, they were successful. And based on these type of experiences, we've developed our tools and methods. So thank you very much, Mohamed Belshi. I'd like to open the floor for questions and answers. We have a couple of minutes left for that. So please, if you have questions, please go ahead. Colleague of Mendoz. Sorry. Sorry. I'm a former colleague of Mendoz at Geneva Call. Um, very good, accurate <laughs> explanation of what the work has been like uh, for many, many years. Um, but I want to come back to this issue, and this actually comes out in your uh, material uh, because I have analyzed your material. <laughs> We were working before it came out, so <laughs> we actually fed into that process. Um, but I think the important thing is when you come up with the actual agreement, whatever it's for, this idea Mendo said about support, because if there's an agreement, you're supposing <laughs> then that the actors can carry out, whether it's the government carrying out demining or whether it's armed groups to try to demobilize children, et cetera, they need support. And what kind of framework is there for that? It's easier with the government because they're legal, but when you're talking about armed groups, they're illegal, it becomes much more challenging. And yet the international community expect uh, these groups to be able to implement their commitments and yet not provide any support. 
They want the monitoring, the verification, all of this, and yet on the other side, when challenges arise that lead to difficulties in implementation, there's no support for it. And I think that this is one issue that the humanitarian community as a whole needs to consider about how better to address it. Secondly, uh, access negotiation, it's really, really important, but I think that more needs to be done on protection, on advocating for protection, on negotiating for general respect of humanitarian norms. And I think that a lot of the contacts, most organizations don't want to talk about, unless it's a very closed network and you know, respecting Chatham House and all of this, they don't want to talk about their negotiations with armed groups. And, uh, and also, if they are, they don't want to go too far for a lot of really good reasons, a lot of security issues, whether it's counterterrorism or other uh, related um, aspects. And so what I'm getting at is they may talk about access, but then they don't talk about protection because they're afraid to lose access, to not be able to carry out humanitarian assistance, provision, etc. And I'm just wondering, you know, this is a shame because they have those contacts already with um, the actors and how then as a community can we address that better? So those are just two points I would like to raise, um, not so much as a question answer, but just to say I think that the humanity, humanitarian community at large needs to consider these if we really want to um, see the benefits on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would someone from the panelists like to react on that point? It's pretty yeah, clear. Basically, every negotiation, um, you are involved with so many actors, like several actors. Each actor has um, its own position and interest in, in the negotiation. There are demands, yet you have uh, a responsibility to serve the people in need as a result of this negotiation. So all of it create pressure on the negotiator. Negotiating under pressure uh, often arises in environments where there is a lot of uh, complex actors or complexity of actors and there is a uh, high stakes when it comes to unpredictability in both the environment, uh, the actors that you're engaging with and also the context. Uh, there are often a lot of unknowns and navigating through that is, is often the most difficult part. What makes the work of negotiation and the work of f the teams in the field so important is that we are there to make sure that the so much needed aid and support is received by the people who need it. In that way, our work is crucial for our organizations and for the people living in difficult contexts where we are working. These are people who cannot meet the requirements they have. So the humanitarian assistance we deliver to them um, is meant to be life-saving, is meant to be um, helping them to, to be more resilient to shocks they receive. Challenges and dilemma that I consider when I negotiate under pressure can be from the context of the negotiation itself and uh, the positions of the interlocutor. When I am in negotiations with an interlocutor, when you find that you are put under pressure in un uh, unprecedented time, so sometimes it will be very difficult for you to engage because he is always at the upper point and controlling your discussion or negotiation. What is uh, for me important to notice is the big challenge to build trust between us and our counterparts when we negotiate under pressure. The another challenge is for me to get access to operate in a very efficient manner in the field. Of course, we face some dilemma. For instance, 
to maintain the negotiation with our counterparts without compromising our principle of action. The most difficult aspect of my job as a negotiator is centered around uh, security. What makes it more challenging is the fact that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Then comes the issue of uh, trying to deal with the culture, language issues surrounding uh, negotiation. Sometimes you really have to uh, work hard in order to convey the message through trans translations, which is not very easy. Uh, some information is lost along the way. It keeps me on my toes, but uh, I love it. I love the challenge. As long as we finally manage to save lives, we remain uh, committed to supporting the needs. This particular retreat we are in Ko right now has been very much focused on uh, giving us tools or sharing with us tools for the important aspect of taking care of ourselves, of dealing with pressure, of dealing with complex situations. The methodology, the approach, I really appreciate the fact to give the opportunity to practitioners, humanitarian practitioners, coming from different horizons, different organizations, to share peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, to share the experience, the success, the affair. I find this methodology very, very useful. These tools are important for us to take away from the street, not just for ourselves, but in fact, more importantly, for our team. Um, as a negotiator, you're always part of a team and that team, uh, the health of that team, uh, mentally and physically, is just as important as the outcome. Thank you very much for sharing these experiences with us. It's been uh, eye-opening and please stick around with us for the next part of the event. And I'd like to invite Nicola Evafel to the floor. Uh, Nicola is an audiovisual producer at the ICRC and also uh, an award-winning filmmaker. Uh, she has previously worked as a journalist for CBC, ABC, Deutsche Welle and the BBC. And currently at the ICRC, uh, her role is to craft stories that show the work of the organization and the work especially that is done on the front lines, uh, in war zones and its role in protecting the laws of war. Um, so. Nicola is going to be walking us through a project she's been involved in uh, with the ICRC uh, entitled Negotiating on the Frontlines. So please, uh, a round of applause for Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, yeah. Okay, thanks. So this is the part that's interactive. So first, I just wanted to talk a bit about, well, that's my landmine uh, finding rat in Mozambique. But I wanted to talk about the power of storytelling um, and its role in humanitarian organizations. So we as a species are addicted to story. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories. When the mind is in a storytelling state, we have better attention, we're more willing to learn and we're more open-minded. And it's interesting for organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross and the work I do there because it's a way for us to build support and empathy for what we do and why we work the way we work, which can be quite complicated to explain. So the frontline negotiators or this story that we created together was a way of taking the really strong aspects of this work that you guys do, which has every element of strong storytelling. The stakes are high, it's dangerous, it's secretive, um, and it really matters if it works. In a lot of ways it's secretive in that you don't talk about what, the way you're working. So, I don't know if any of you have seen this show. So this is Netflix's first experimentation with interactive storytelling. And in a way, interactive storytelling isn't new in that, I don't know if any of you remember in the 80s, and 70s, there were the Choose Your Own Adventures children's books where you could make decisions about how the story unfolded. But now in a digital age, you can make this, you can, the audience can direct the narrative digitally immediately as they watch the story. So 
working with the frontline negotiations team at CCHN, we looked at the narratives that you guys experience, the dilemmas you face, and the ways to make it interactive, and we mapped out the narrative with four different endings, which we're gonna work on together. But I also wanted to tell you that we took this idea to Twitter, and they really liked the idea, and they hacked Twitter a little bit to make it work on Twitter. And just to show the appetite for this kind of storytelling, um, it's ICRC's most liked tweet of all time, um, and one of our, among well, our top retweets. So I don't wanna take you through the Twitter thread, but I wanna take you to the website um, and play it together. Play. But if you can, when you're making your choices, if you could raise your hand and then we'll decide together which route and decisions we make, okay? Um, so I need to escape. Ah, great. Okay. Thank you. Where's the mouse? Ah, oh, there. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> so, I'm going to have to bring this over. <laughs> Thank you. So. You're on your way to the besieged city of Erdul. The government has authorized you to enter and deliver food. At the checkpoints, the guards say their families are suffering now. They want a cut in the aid. Do you refuse, explaining you have to prioritize those inside the besieged city? Do you agree and try to limit the amount you give them? Or do you offer to assess their needs once you've completed the distribution in the besieged city? So can you raise your arms if you think refuse? Okay. Agree? Okay, these are pros in the room. Um, or offer? All right, that's pretty clear. Okay. Ah. So we have to offer. Okay. okay, so the guards agree. When you do assess their needs, you don't see a shortage of food, but there, there is a problem with the water system. Your engineering colleagues come um, to repair it, but first the guards keep to their promise and they let you enter the besieged city. But just as you start your engines to pass the checkpoint, your colleagues radio you to warn you fresh shelling on the besieged city is imminent. The guards at the checkpoint say this is not true. Do you accept the guards' reassurances and enter the besieged city? Do you decide the risks are too high and return to your field office? Or do you request the guards contact their, their commander for confirmation of safe passage? So hands up for accept. Um, decide the risk is too high. Or request the guards contact their commander. <laughs> okay. Okay. You hear the guards superior radio confirmation that no shelling is planned for today and you enter the besieged city. Upon arrival at the town hall, the self-appointed governor of the besieged city claims he must administer the aid himself. You fear he will favor his supporters and disadvantage those loyal to the government. Do you let him administer the aid or offer to distribute together? Together? Okay, hands up for together. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not as fun when you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> um, maybe I have to go down a bit. The government agrees during the distribution, oh sorry, the governor agrees. During the distribution, you note three boxes of food have disappeared, but you're re relieved that most of the food got through to those in need. While there, you see many civilians wounded and in desperate need of medical attention. Do you put the wounded in the now empty food trunks and hope the guards will let you pass and take them for medical treatment in the city? Or do you tell them you will return as soon as possible, you need to get safe passage assurances from the, gov the government for a medical evacuation? So uh, put the wounded in the now empty truck. Um, tell them <laughs> you will return as soon as possible. Okay. <laughs> um, you feel awful leaving the wounded behind. Back in the field office, your boss talks to her contacts in the government and requests the green light for the medical evacuation the following day. She is successful. You return with 
three, with five ambulances the next day. Okay, the five ambulances passed the checkpoint without a problem. You managed to take all five wounded to hospital for treatment. You feel elated for an evening. You managed to get aid in and the wounded out and treated. Well done. You took the best decisions you could. By the way, this can play out very differently, but <laughs> you guys took good decisions. This interactive narrative aims to show how frontline negotiations face horrific dilemmas and have to strike a brutal balance between impact and principles. So that is the interactive narrative. And of course, it's a superficial experience, but I think it was a great way with the CECHN team to talk to the general public about what we do. So I'm looking for Kareem. Oh, there you are. Thank you very much. So uh, you've had a, a sneak peek into the lives of Pascal Hund, Julie Dunphy, and Mehmet Balchi. Uh, so first of all, Pascal, what do you think of this of this project? Do you think it's it's accurate? Does it show the dilemmas that we face in the field regularly? I cheat a bit because I saw it the other day. No, I, I found it extremely good. Uh, I think the, and the participants were quite brilliant because, uh, you know, at the end, the outcome was good. No, I think it's quite good. Uh, I don't know, maybe you should ask others, but, you know, even with experience, when seeing that, it reflects quite well the reality we are confronted with. What about you, Julie? What are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, no, I very much like it. Um, and, you know, when I uh, looked at the, the storytelling tool the other week, because like Pascal, I had a sneak preview, um, I did get the answers right. <laughs> but I also tried the other ones, because I thought some people maybe would look at the principled humanitarian approach uh, with the first question saying, no, we can't talk to the military. We need to get into the area. And it was a very good way f to learn. And I think particularly it's moving with the times, as has as already been reflected. Uh, the fact that it's uh, so positive on Twitter, I mean, this is what, how people learn. They learn in, in short, sharp nodes. Uh, we use technology when we're moving all the time, and, and these short snippets are a fantastic way. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to, to using it uh, more regularly as well. Thanks. Well, there's one point that I was hesitating, really, to, to leave or to, um, to take them with me. So this is, uh, I mean, I think people are expecting you. Uh, it's good you are able to come back, but if you don't come back, you lose all the credibility. Mm -hmm. You said you didn't do whatever you should have done, maybe. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the very problematic, but this is, you have to take the decision there. So if I had a volunteer to stay with them, I would leave him with the, with the wounded. They say, you know, I will come back to try to do my best. Interesting. Thank you. So uh, an example of a classic dilemma. And a dilemma, by definition, is that we're confronted by several choices that are equally undesirable. Yeah? That's the reality of, uh, of, of humanitarian work, often. So uh, we'd like to show you a video of uh, what some of uh, our practitioners, members of the CCHN Community of Practice, had to say about this project. Yeah, I think that uh, the storyline that this interactive storytelling uh, project is presenting to us reflects uh, some, some of the situations we do face in the fields, especially in complex environments and conflictive settings. I can't just give you an example. When one day I have to negotiate with uh, armed groups in order to uh, carry out our activities in the area who are under the control of this armed group without, without compromising our principle of action. When in the scenario, the uh, member of the armed groups discussing trying to negotiate with the, uh, with the delegates the way to divide the assistance, uh, not considering only the area where the teams make a variation, 
but also to consider the area uh, which under the control of the arm group. I cannot say the context, but personally I uh, face to uh, such situation where they try to influence, they try to, how to say, uh, to bring you to uh, do your job, your assistant, like they want and not like you, you want. For the ICRC uh, scenario, I cannot admit that there are true stories. I can give you an example. Uh, way back uh, when uh, in my project when I was uh, coordinating and monitoring on uh, LDP's uh, movement, so it involved frequent movement that I have to go across uh, several uh, checkpoints. At one point, one of the checkpoint guy was asking me for a lift. So with the principle of humanitarian that we don't carry harm persons or uh, on board, so it prompted me to have kind of discussions, negotiations with the persons, uh, how impossible it would be. I, I made him understand in a way that for me to carry an armed guard, put him in, on board with me and taking him across the, uh, the, the checkpoint to another place, so the impression would be very bad because when others see, when others see, and then I will not have that same whatever, uh, same objections for them. We want to maintain also that impartiality of humanitarians because we don't want to take part. I do think that some of the dilemmas that arise out of those challenges could be explored further. So what, what, what happens to the other actors in this scenario? What happens to your relationships at a later stage because of some of these decisions you've made when faced with the challenges? It is important for the public to understand what we go through so that they also understand how to relate with us. Our efforts are ongoing. Whenever we, we uh, get to hear of such in, in issues, we take action. This kind of projects or the work that the center does um, is, is key to make sure we have, um, first of all, the support from public and also maybe to remove some of the confusions around what we are doing in the field. It starts to mark how we measure success. Uh, success isn't always delivering the assistance. It may be making very principled decisions uh, long before that and having discussions with your donors, with, with other partners and with stakeholders that have the ability to influence uh, this situation at a very early stage. So I think that essentially presenting these realistic scenarios as the storytelling project did allows us a platform or a way to um, uh, sympathise or empathise with someone who's delivering these projects and puts yourself in that position uh, and, and lets you assess how you would, you know, how would you assess those results, how would you assess the success when faced with such dilemmas. It's worth telling uh, so that the world should know that it's not only a normal uh, living uh, situations for every person uh, that uh, encounter more dangers than uh, humanitarian because we really go for it. Uh, humanitarian always go to the front line, they go face to face with their, uh, uh, with the perpetrators uh, and sometimes uh, uh, making sure that they put their life across the line for the benefit of people who are suffering. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the session, but Kareem just asked me to, if there's any questions before we close for any of the panelists or anything about the project, the storytelling project. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to know how often do you do these kind of pilot storytelling stories for even training your own newly recruited staff to sometimes be a negotiator or go into the field because it's a very powerful way of giving a slice of reality by not being there. So how complex can you make the game or how simple do you have to make the game to communicate the basics of negotiation? Good question. Um, I mean, I can talk from the communications perspective and one of the great things about working at the International Committee of the Red Cross is we're asked to constantly learn. So I learned about interactive storytelling and applied it. But in terms of using it as a tool for training, I don't know who's best placed to answer that. 
this is the first time, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's something we could develop. Um, but it's not really my call. <laughs> um, anything else before we close? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll come to you after. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Christophe Barbet from the Center for Global Non-Killing, and I think you permanently miss a conscientious objector in your project. To give a concrete example, I was fine with everything going on until you got the wounded out, and one of them died in the 24-hour. Uh, so I'm not so sure there's only one solution, and I'm not so sure the program really shows, like, another line. Do you have another alternative? Be creative. It's not just a question of mode or even safety. Sometimes it's a question of intelligence, and for that we need freedom of thought. And kind of the, I like the labyrinths, of course, and I think I'm very happy for your success, but I still object. I hear your objection. Um, and yeah, it is, a, it is a question about whether we make it more complicated, because it could have been more than those options at that stage. Um, yes, and then there was just one last question here, was it? Or is it you? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just what, one little question um, about the negotiators and uh, how important is the space, is given a space to psychological support to negotiators and... Uh, Even yeah. humanitarians in general, humanitarians probably. Humanitarians in general, yeah. but... Yeah. Especially negotiator uh, under actually, high pressure. Yeah. What you're talking about, and I'll hand back to them because I don't know, but it's something yeah. that I've been exploring with um, Andreas and the team about talking about how to deal with stress in these situations. And I don't know whether historically we have been that good at doing it. Yeah, I think what is important, the, the source of stress are, I, I would say, manifold. And very often it's not, with my experience, not the negotiation that is the more stressful, is the, the rest of the environment. Uh, being confronted, you know, in, in combat zone, in conflict area, in, with, with daily insecurity. But your point is perfectly correct, and, and I think there is, you know, the duty of care of humanitarian organization to take care of, your, of their staff, uh, to cope with sometimes the impossible and the insecurity on a daily basis, and not only the one deriving from negotiation. Yeah, um, I think from the UN perspective, um, we not we are not necessarily good at um, identifying that this is a stress-related issue. However, um, our counselling services within the UN um, offers you uh, you know advice and support for many di different um, issues. Um, yes, it's traditionally the critical incident that usually there's uh, psychological support uh, immediately deployed and made available. However, within my own organisation we have a number of regional um, psychologists in place, we have country peer advisors and support, so we have a network and a mechanism available and certainly you know, within the workplace um, and under the duty of care portfolio, it's certainly addressed in terms of it, but it's not necessarily, again, because there's a whole range of, of issues and challenges that staff have. It's not just the staff who are negotiating, it's staff who, for in my organisation, are hearing harrowing stories um, as they, um, you know, face everyday protection issues. So uh, that mechanism is available and counselling services available for them to avail of. I would just add another layer. I think from organization perspective, when you hire people, hire staff, you should understand that really if the staff is humanitarian uh, vocation, that if they have a really vocation to be a humanitarian, it is very important. So then it's not and really, uh, of course, there's a lot of professionalism there. You need to be professional, you need to be, uh, you need skills, but still the humanitarian vocation is very important. Therefore, when you send people in the difficult situations, the difficult countries, so you have to really assess really how much these people can uh, absorb the mission. Yeah. This is very important, I think, uh, for the, uh, I think, of course, I agree with what was said. <laughs> that, that's my uh, add. Okay, I think we're going to close now. Kareem, you want to say anything? Yeah.
So, thank you very much for your interest in the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiations and the work we've been involved in. I'd just like to thank Fight for Humanity for uh, collaborating with us on this event. I'd also like to thank our panelists, Pascal Hunt, thank you very much. Julie Danfi, also thank you very much. Mehmet Balchi, thank you for being here. And last but not least, Nicola, thank you very much for sharing with us your project. Um, it's very interesting, it's been one of the highly tweeted uh, projects of the ICRC recently. Uh, so thank you and we look forward to further collaboration with you as well. All right, thank you.